Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much for joining us here to discuss uh, the latest book from Surjit Bhalla. Let me start by talking to you uh, about an issue that I know that, uh, as the finance minister pointed out, uh, there's absolutely no ambiguity on which side of the camp you stand on, and that is as far as uh, uh, the inflation debate is concerned. And in the book, you talk about the fact that we're now back in an era of the great inflation decline, which mirrors the period that we saw in the 1950s and the 1960s. You caution that many central bankers, in particular, you, you, uh, you talk about how Alan Green's and seem to have read the, the tea leaves wrong when it comes to inflation. And maybe that, that's uh, something that we're seeing currently as well in a, in a lot of countries. But on the great inflation decline, linking that to what we're seeing with the forces of education, with uh, uh, the link to education and income, uh, let me start by getting your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, it's uh, quite remarkable. And I'll give you one statistic which helps explain uh, what I mean by the fact that inflation is dead. If you look at the US, the mean wage increase over the last 35, 40 years has been close to 2 or 3% for the entire labor force. Matter of fact, for the bottom 60% uh, 60, 60 or so, there's been a marginal decline. Mm -hmm. So. Wages, you know, before the era of the 1970s when oil came in and, and confused all of us and brought in high inflation in all the countries of the world, wages were the major form of inflation. And wages are, remain the major form of inflation. Um, commodities and oil no longer uh, determine the path of inflation. But don't tell that to the RBI. Um, <laughs> now, let me give you an example on oil. That in 19, you know, oil prices quadrupled in 1973 right. and doubled in 1979. And that is behind what most of us think about uh, when we think about inflation. Well, in 1998, oil price was $10 a barrel, went to $140 a barrel mm -hmm. in 2008. Mm -hmm. And inflation in every country of the world declined, except India. Okay? And there's the India is a special case starting in about 2004 to 2013. Yes. Completely divergent. So I think you know, the reason why, now I come to the real, um, if you will, <coughs> point or examination or evidence, why is it that wages are not rising. Mm. And the wages are not rising because there are too many people like you and me and like the rest of the audience in the developing world, which after all has something like 80% of the world's population. So that is, so if, if a firm is there in the US or in Germany or in Japan or in Europe, wants to hire somebody and telecommunications is now very easy uh, there are no hurdles to getting work done. Mm -hmm. They'll hire somebody from here, or they'll hire somebody from um, Pakistan, or mm. Bangladesh, or Sri Lanka, or Chile, mm. or Korea. So, would you agree uh, with the hypothesis that we just heard from Surjit Bhalla that inflation is dead? Well, I think that uh, uh, in addition to what Surjit has said, there is, apart from the U.S., uh, further evidence that. The entire philosophy of quantitative easing uh, is designed to, in fact, uh, rekindle inflation. I mean, if you look at Japan, for instance, sure. Ajit, uh, for, for a long time, uh, the success or the otherwise of the Abe administration is contingent on whether or not uh, inflation, to some extent, has we'll head back to 2%. Percent, we'll yeah. to 2 percent. Or even in Europe, I think that the rekindling of inflation is really one of the uh, important objectives of which the quantitative easing policy does. And I think there's a linkage between quantitative easing philosophy, which has dominated, and the need to really rekindle inflation. Mm. But, uh, uh, and where I also agree that the fact that um, in the entire value-added chain, the fact that you can uh, begin to look at the wage rate differentials mm. globally is an important attribute which enables wages to be kept uh, at rather low levels. And, and Sujit, in, in a very recent uh, uh, seminar which, in which uh, 
synchronized with the annual meeting of IMF and, and the World, World Bank, Bank yeah. where Finance Minister was also there. Larry Summers, when he spoke on uh, this entire issue of some of the hurdles on globalization, mm -hmm. said as long as the wage rate differentials continue to vary between one to five, between some countries uh, which, where wage rates are low, as compared to countries where the wage rates are high, globalization will be inherently in danger. Mm. And this, he believes, is the philosophy which has really gripped the United States and could be the basis for some of the factors which has led to the growth of Trumponomics. Since you're talking about Trumponomics, and you write about this in your book, Surjit Bala, and so let me uh, come to you uh, with that. You say that the news about the premature death of globalization is vastly exaggerated, and I would take the argument forward from what we just heard there from Mr. Singh. Why do you believe that we're going to get past this business of Trumponomics? Why do you believe that the threat of globalization uh, or the premature death of globalization is vastly exaggerated? You know, <coughs> there are, what, 7.2 billion people in the world about less than one billion reside in the Western world. And this world is very different than even 30, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. So globalization um, 20 years ago, even 10, 15 years ago, was what the Western world would produce and how they would hire us and so on and so forth. So that to them was globalization, the welfare improvement of the Western world. Well, you know, the 90% of the world is not going to sit back and say, oh my God, you know, these guys' wages are not going up and they are not globalizing. We are globalizing. Mm -hmm. Globalization is the world, not, and actually, you know, that brings me to the point on inequality. And let me explain it sure. via inequality. The popular assumption, you know, we have to admit that the Western world dominates. Uh, America dominates, the English-speaking Western world dominates discussions and our views on various aspects, mm -hmm. okay? We echo it, the RBI echoes it, you echo it. That's the second time you so pointed out the Reserve Bank. I'll, yeah, come, exactly. I'll come to that yeah, yeah. in just but a second. No, yes. So basically, the, the now he lost my train of thought, <laughs> what I was saying because of the... the income equality, yeah, yes. Yeah, income inequality. So what we have is today in the U.S., inequality is at the highest levels ever, okay? You go back to 1820, which is the earliest uh, data that we have for the U.S., um, and today, inequality in the U.S. is definitely, without a doubt, the highest level ever. Second, you look at U.K., mm -hmm. it reached its peak somewhere around 2007 and 2008, and inequality there is about 10% lower. Look at the world. World inequality is today, and this is globalization, is at 1870 levels. And why? Because people, the vast majority of people, 90% have had wage rate growth or income growth of 5 6% per annum. Mm. Just take China and India and you'll get the answer. And the Western world hasn't. They are the rich guys. We are here. We are moving up. They are staying there. Inequality is down. So same thing with globalization. They think globalization is over. But for the rest of us, globalization has a long, long way to go. Since we're talking about, uh, you know, incomes, and I, I, I want to get both of you to comment on this, and you write about this in, in the book, the connection between education and income. Uh, we've just had rating agencies put out their reports on India, uh, while Moody's has upgraded uh, its status quo from S&P. And one of the reasons why the rating agencies say that they're constrained from, uh, you know, an upgrade is the fact that our per capita income is much lower in comparison to our peers. Uh, and I know I know you have you have strong views on that. So so let me get let me get you to uh, to counter that argument. You know, I, quite honestly, um, that was the very first time, and I've been in the financial world for now 30, 40 years that I heard that argument. After all, ratings are supposed to be about risk, are supposed to be about return on your investment and the risk to that investment. I'm afraid Standard and Poor's hasn't talked to all the foreign investors that are pumping their money into India, all the foreign investors who are buying Indian bonds because they think there'll be a large rate of return, and the volatility <coughs> in the Indian currency has become one of all-time lows. So I don't know who they 
talking about. It's, it's a serious problem, and I hope to write something on it, but I have never heard that the per capita income of a country has something to do with its rating. This is turning ratings upside down and sideways. Is it turning ratings upside down and sideways, N.K. Singh? You, you've, been, you've been a veteran, a veteran of, of, of seeing this cycle play out. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think, Sujit, when you say this is the first time uh, that you have heard this argument, uh, this is, as far as I'm concerned, the second time that <laughs> I've heard this argument. Uh, this is because the first time that I heard this argument was uh, as chairman of the FRBM uh, committee, I had interactions with these, uh, with these rating agencies, including S&P and, and so on. And now that the whole thing is over, I can certainly share the fact that uh, they argued not that the per capita income per se was low, mm. but they argued that for a country with this kind of per capita income, the fiscal uh, and the debt was far too high. high. So yeah. it was an alignment of the debt and fiscal story mm. with the levels of per capita income and not per capita income per, Alone. Se, uh, per se. But having said that, I agree with the fact that whether this kind of linkage is really methodologically flawed or not, mm -hmm. is, it remains a very dubious proposition, uh, but that they have been now for quite some time trotting this argument.